All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, good to see everybody. And looks like we have a number of people online as well. Um, let's just start with um, our introductions. Just go around the room here. Okay. Uh, Marissa Weinberg, Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands. Jeff Denblaker with Jacobs Engineering. Christine Lindsay, USGS. Andy Carlson, USGS. Tim Hodges for the French. Joe Havasey, Compass Minerals. John Lowe, Wildlife Resources. David O'Leary, USGS. Tim Harris, Division of Quality. Ben Sarah, Forest Street Fire and State Lands. Tom Tripp, US Magnesium. Jennifer Vicks, Forest Street Fire and State Lands. Mark Reynolds, US Magnesium. Phil Brown, Branch from Crawford. Laura Vernon, Water Resources. Great. All right, and then online, I see Andrew Rupke and Elliot Jagniecki from UGS. Is that, is that everybody online? We're here. Glad you could make it. I guess that's everybody. All right, well, um, just the, the focus of today's meeting, I think, is, is largely to just get, provide an update on conditions in the lake, but also the calculations that we've been doing. Um, as you know, over the last several months, we've been trying to, I guess we've been monitoring the changes in the lake, but then also uh, talking a lot about how we can make decisions, um, you know, to manage salinity via uh, the berm. Um, so last month, I think the key um, outcome was that we had approved our rubric, you know, which is based on the, the protocol um, that we developed earlier this year. We're just talking about how we can calculate the salinity in the lake um, so that we can come up with some numbers that, that we compare to the salinity objectives. And, and I guess just to remind everybody, the, those salinity objectives were developed primarily to be able to um, manage the overall salinity in the lake and, and fundamentally is how we manage the burn. Um, and, and then that, so just to be able to be able to use that lever in, in protecting the uses of the lake. Um, so what, what we want to do today is I, I guess continue that conversation. Um, something that we left on the table last month was the berm height. Um, you know that we decided last month that we would leave it as is and, and continue the conversation this month. I don't know that there's an, I guess that's something we want to talk about today is do we leave it on the table again or is, do we have enough information to be able to um, make a recommendation on, on a change? And Jeff, maybe I might just mention, I think our USGS update might have a little bit of context in how we determine how to move forward um, based on their site visit earlier this week. So hopefully we can hold off on that part of the discussion until after them. Yeah. Good. So I guess just looking at the agenda, that's basically what we'll be doing is looking at lake conditions. Um, you know, this uh, brief update on the protocol, and we'll be talking about the salinity data and, um, and our approximations for this fall and next spring. So any any questions on that or anything else we want to add to the agenda? All right, well, one, one of the things I had sent out to the committee members for review and would like to see if uh, there's any comments on our, the summary of the July 27th meeting. Um, yes, if there's, and if there aren't any changes that you'd like to make, um, I have a motion to approve. So move. I'll second. All right, thank you. And can we just do a, a voice vote? Um, all those in favor of approving the meeting summary, say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Any abstentions? <laughs> all right, approved. Thank you. All right, do you, are you on the Google meeting? I believe so. Can you try to check? Yes. <clears throat> Yes. 
drawing now. No, I lost the network connection. Just as. Wait, looks like it's coming. Yeah. I think that's a, I think that's Andrew, can you see it? Mm -hmm. Not yet. I'm sharing your desktop or just your tab? Um, I tried both. It's the entire screen. And if you make that bigger, does it? Um, it just won't go. On this end, it look, just looks frozen. Do you have to push the enable, enable editing? Does that change anything for you? I think so. <laughs> Which are you all just signed on to the guest network? Yeah. Should we maybe did it work if we signed on to the DNR network? Did, 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 did that solve it yesterday or I don't know. Or? Kyle was yeah, yeah, working the computer. The, I'm not sure how. Do you want to try a different network and maybe I'll just sign in under my you can see the sure. what, do I do that? Um, just change your Wi Fi and do the uh, UWDM network. Yeah. And then I need to you just maybe unplug that and on. And you won't see my password. Let me go grab a hardline Ethernet connection. Okay. Sorry, Looks like it's working now. Something, oh, wrong, something wrong with the guest. Okay. Well, I've been in conversation with our usual suspects. So I'll call them again. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. We love our technical support. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we'll um, we'll just start off with uh, an update mm -hmm. on lake conditions. And uh, Andy's going to help me with the breach stuff. He was out there on Tuesday, so he can kind of give you a firsthand account of what's happening out there. So we'll just start with um, lake elevation. As of yesterday, we were sitting at 4192.7 in the south arm. This plot shows kind of the last uh, three years of elevation. And just something to highlight is that we started the decline in elevation um, like mid to late June, our high was 4194 um, in mid to late June, as opposed to the previous two years when we started declining in about April and May. So we uh, started seeing that decrease later. And in addition to that, the magnitude of decrease is about 1.3 feet since our high. Um, in the last couple of years, that was about two feet by this time of year. If we look at saline, the um, daily value as of a couple days ago, it was 4189.0 relative to our spring high, which was 4189.8 in late March. Uh, we're down about 8.83 since then. And uh, the slope of this decline is less than it has been in previous years, but still pretty low. Um, the difference between the north and south arms is about 3.7 feet, uh, largely due to that berm that's in place there, but that's kind of where we stand now. And then if we take a look at 
inflows coming in this water year. I'll kind of just go through our four main gauges. So these plots are showing cumulative stream flow in millions of acre feet um, from the start of the water year on October 1st. And the black line represents our current water year. And the blue line is historical max. The orange line is historical minimum. And then this green shaded area is kind of the 25th and 75th percentile of our historical record. In this case, for Bear River at Corinne, um, the record is 60, around 60, uh, 66 to 68 years. So at Corinne, um, where we are sitting right now, this August 21st was we're somewhere between the median and 75th percentiles of flow around you know, 1.2 million acre feet have passed by that gauge this year. If you look at Weber, um, kind of started off below the 25th percentile and then March, April, April really started to ramp up. And now we're sitting right at that 75th percentile of flow, so above, above the central tendency. Uh, so far, about half a million acre feet have passed by that gauge. For the Goggin, we this year is you know trended to be you know near median and above median the whole year. Currently, we're sitting above the 75th percentile, and an estimated 0.194 million acre feet have passed by that gauge. And then lastly, Farmington Bay, we started off being below the historical low and have now um, increased the flow, and we're now we're above the historical high roughly, which and we've. Um, Flow past this gauge is about 0.361 million acre feet. And uh, in all, as of this, where we are at this point in the water year, we uh, have a cumulative 2.26 million acre feet that have flown into or, yeah, that have flowed into the south arm. And relative to our big year um, in 2011, we saw about 3.46 million acre feet. Um, this time of year. So we're above the average, which I believe is about one and a half million acre feet, but we're not quite as high as that 2011 water year. And now I'll let AK kind of for Andy go through um, the discharges and the new breach conditions. Okay. Um, so just for a little background, I am the hydrologic technician primarily responsible for most flow stuff with the Great Salt Lakes. I do all the causeway stuff and then also elevation gauges at saline and uh, salt air. Um, so, but we're talking about the breach, which I was just saying on Tuesday, um, as you can see the, since the raising of the berm, it's really brought south to north, north to south flow to, to zero and, uh, tracking with elevation, we have higher flows from south to north, but, uh, still no flow from, from north to south. Um, I don't know what else Ryan usually talks about. But. Yeah. Um, just like these last four, one point he wanted to make was that the kind of the last four measurements are showing we're still transporting quite a bit of flow from south to north. I think that this peak here, um, I thought it was maybe May or June, was around 1250 CFS, and then Andy measured 933 CFS a couple of days ago. So it's still quite a bit of flow there. Quite a bit of flow, and it's been pretty static over the last you know few few measurements the scale makes it look like there's a, a strong dip but it's really been between you know a thousand and fifteen hundred for the last two months has anyone tried to estimate the elevation of the berm has it eroded much with the flow that's gone over the last four months i assume so we'll get to that i'll, I'll step back <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think oh, one last go. point there is i mean it looks like we've had a good two months of Flows that have exceeded 900 CFS. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, this is our lake surface elevation from the bridge at the causeway, uh, plotted with velocity of the two highest uh, bins for the ADBM that's in place there. Um, and speaking to erosion of the berm, I think you could see at a couple points where the berm has, can you see my pointer? Mm, no, don't see it. Well, I can, I can do it with dates. Uh, right before May 28th, you see a spike in velocity. And then again, around June 11th, you see another spike in velocity. And uh, I think that's where you see the, We've already self self decided we're taking the berm down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. Like the berm's kind of doing it all on its own, right? And this is a 
a video from Tuesday and I did um, a quick and dirty bathymetry across the, the berm to see how much uh, erosion has happened. And it's, it was not ideal conditions. So when it was cranking and, and it was raining pretty hard and uh, there was a, a, almost a foot fluctuation in elevation just in the, in the breach, you know, but um, I, I estimate that the, um, the deepest part of the erosion on the berm is probably between two and a half and three feet. So instead of being 4192, the low spot might be 89 already. Yeah. Which accounts for the decline I was surprised to see. I didn't think it decline as much as it has. Yeah, and I think that those, uh, if we go back to those spikes in velocity, yeah. I think that's when, you know, progressive blowing out of chunks of the berm, you know, raise the velocity. Mm -hmm. And then as, you know, flows settle down, as it's coming down along here, it's, uh, you know, velocity is slowing down as it's as it's spinning itself across the that head difference. It's interesting. I think that west side was the widest part of the berm too. It was. Okay. Not to you again. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions for Andy? He's out there, out on the ground. Did you look at the west open? The west culvert, the west opening, or lakeside. Lakeside. Oh, lakeside. Yeah, I, I mean, I drive by it every time I go out. Does so it got full? No. Andy, I, I was curious. Are you? I know that part of the um, agreement we have with USGS is to do some more of that bathymetry on the berm. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a timeline for when you'll get? You know, I know you need better conditions, but when will you? Sure. Get, when do you guys think you'll be out there to do that? Uh, so I believe the initial data collection has already happened. Oh, okay. I, I didn't end up being a part of that, but it should have happened on the ninth but then uh everybody kind of went on vacation so processing is ongoing as i understand it yes thank you and then we'll have a better once that's processed we'll have a better idea of, of how much promotion yeah. if you guys have a timeline right when you think you might have that done it'd be nice to know when we can get some more solid data on what the part looks like now i talked to casey a few weeks ago and he thought that we would be able to get preliminary information at least by the end of september he didn't think it would take too long to process but if there's um, a need, we can try to speed that along. The, the sooner the better, I think, just as we're trying to make decisions, but if, that's, if it takes that long. Then... Do we have a chemistry that's in the south end going through the breach? Yeah. We do. So we, um, I believe our, was our last water quality measurement, I think it was in July, end of July. Um, and 20, I actually have 21st that. 21st or 20th. So the, I put that on here, Tom. So it was on 28th, uh, 135 grams per liter. Is what that salinity was. That's what the flow is. The, the, the concentration. In the flow that's going to. Yep. So we can jump to salinity now. Um, this is kind of the last thing for current conditions. So this is the plot you're all familiar with. We're used to seeing salinity in grams per liter on the y axis. Plotting our full record here from 2010 to present. Um, and just want to highlight that we're, you know, we're in that range of 120 to 160 grams per liter, which has been identified by this group as optimal for the south arm. Uh, we did reach a low in June, around 130 grams per liter, and we've had a gradual uptick in salinity since then. Our most recent salinities at our sites in Gilbert Bay at 3510 and Harrington Bay at 2565 were 139 and 138 grams per liter. And then, um, as we just pointed out, at the breach, end of July was 135. And at Saltaire, um, on August 14th, just a few days before these open water samples, it was 138 grams per liter. So it appears to be pretty well mixed, although I will say the site up um, by Bear River, that's 2267, that's still more dilute than our other site. If we zoom in on the last couple of years of records to see kind of these temporal patterns in more detail, I'll just highlight that again, last fall when we were at our historic low lake level in the south arm at about 185 grams per liter, uh, we've sent, we reached diluted substantially over the spring to 132, 124 grams per liter, and are currently again at 139. So from last November to now, we've gone down in salinity in Gilbert Bay by an estimated 46 grams per liter and Carrington Bay by 48 grams per liter. So that's just kind of the magnitude of change that we've seen over the last 10 months or so. Chris, 
Christine, where were we at this point last year? Just by way of reference. I know it's on your graph. Right? Yeah, let's see. So that would be right around here. We actually weren't able to get out um, during this time last year. So I guess it. September would be about 60, 70, 180 grams per liter. Thank you. Yep. Okay. And uh, then I just wanted to, again, look at the spatial variability of these salinity measurements from last November. What I really want to highlight is just how homogenous these are spatially, you know, in this, this time of year in the fall. This is when we had our 185 grams per liter. We saw progressive kind of dilution as well as more heterogeneity, especially at this site fed by the Bear River. And then that brings us today where we're kind of converging again on more homogenous conditions spatially. Um, but in the most recent measurement on August 17th, we did see this 2267 being more dilute. That concentration was around 115 grams per liter. So just we kind of had a more, you know, more variable conditions through the spring and summer, kind of converged on more um, uniform conditions, and now we're kind of seeing a little more potential runoff from the Bear River creating heterogeneity. So um, I think I'll stop there for now, okay. and if you want. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, did you want to give an update? Yeah, yeah. maybe before we um, do that, we can, since Brian uh, was here today, and I think I don't know if everybody's met Brian, but uh, in this new role, I think this is maybe the second meeting we've had, and, and the first uh, Salinity Committee meeting that he's been involved with. So I don't know if you want to say a few words, Brian, or the commissioner's office. So uh, first, I want to say thanks for sending me the seat. Uh, I've noticed it goes down, but not up, uh, <laughs> which is fantastic. Uh, it reminds me, when I worked at the Department of Interior, you would go to meet with the Secretary of Interior and put you in a seat. <laughs> The hydraulics were broken in that seat, and so you'd be going in the meeting. <laughs> Pretty soon you're sitting down looking up at the Secretary of the Interior. So I'm glad to join the adults table. <laughs> I look forward to being part of the conversation. Uh, listen, I just wanted to say mostly thank you. Uh, you all have been doing a phenomenal job of monitoring uh, a situation which really cost us all quite a lot um, when it comes to the salinity levels of the lake. Uh, I think that if you're talking about proximal threats um, uh, that we all fear uh, from a regulatory environment, that proximal threat would be first and foremost salinity. So monitoring where we are on that is particularly important and taking active steps to, to make uh, improvements in that, uh, even on an emergency basis, I think has been really, really, really meaningful. So thanks so much. Uh, in my role as Grace Valley Commissioner, I look forward to working with you all to maintain those successes. And in fact, make make sure that we can make some of those successes uh, more permanent in the sense that we we can monitor and have adaptive management on a more regular basis, and want to make sure that we don't reach those major levels that I think we were we were arriving at last fall. So um, I don't have much more to say besides I look forward to working with you all in September. I really do appreciate the work you've done here before. Uh, I look forward to more good work in the future. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you. And yeah, uh, save the seat for me. It's great. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. I, I hope you're able to join us. There's a, I think, as far as I'm concerned, uh, of all the different meetings that happen, this group here, you know, comes up with a lot more product and just actual okay. on the ground information than I experience in a lot of these other meetings. So it's well, been really that's what I would have to say as well. In terms of just looking at the work that's done by this body, it is meaningful and actionable, mm -hmm. and that makes it different than a lot of other groups that we together. That might be meaningful, but as often not actionable, uh, and that's I think where this is a part. So, congratulations on setting something up effective, uh, and look forward to, to being part of it. Thanks. Yeah, exactly what Brian said. Thanks, everybody. Um, I think as far as like updates go from our end, we still haven't adopted the recommendation that was uh, given to us. I think we um, ultimately really want to make sure that Brian is able to get up to speed, and I think there's a lot of nuances with this and. I think some of these observations um, that we have on the berm right now and being able to understand what nature did to the berm uh, makes a big difference for us because if we've already shaved off a few feet off the berm, you know, I don't know that there's as much of a need. And then also knowing how big of a head difference we had on that uh, breach at that time and what's physically possible to throw uh, flow through the breach, I think also gives us an understanding of like whether it even makes sense to lower it. Because I think that um, as far as I'm concerned, there's there's you know, even if we lowered it, there's not a whole lot of you know, extra water that can flow through right now. So we need to weigh that and decide 
you know, what that looks like. And I think that, um, you know, today Jeff and I had talked a little bit earlier about what it looks like, but I think, um, you know, knowing what's flowing through and knowing what's, uh, what the elevation of the berm is approximately with that rough and dirty data, um, we can approximate like about how much more water we might expect to see, you know, go through between now and when runoff season starts. Um, and I think that's probably what we should be looking at at this point. I don't know that it makes sense to go in and modify the berm down anymore, but I think we should continue to let it, you know, flow through as it is, and then uh, probably look at like when we might want to consider modifying it up. And, and if I might, I think that really key to that conversation is effective salinity uh, and how how this is impacting salinity. So let's because I, I, we, we all know that there's a freshwater lens. Uh, we might be skimming off the top of that freshwater lens. That's an interesting perspective, but not really. But no. Not really. That's doesn't uh, demonstrate by the data. Yeah. So I'm just saying that's what we need. They've got to be data decisions. That's how that's all. Well, and I, I think earlier in the season that freshwater lens was so fair. Like we did have yeah. fresh water that was spilling. So I think part of the what well, you know what Brian's getting at here too is these recommendations that we look at moving forward. I think we ought to consider you know what is this the spring runoff look like next year. If we simply said, okay, I think we got lucky and we hit a really good spot with the berm. Let's just see how next year plays out, we might actually end up seeing most of the fresh water just skirt right out over the, the breach into the north arm. So I do think that um, there are some advantages to continuing to let this flow through the berm um, or through the breach at this point and then deciding you know, what we would want to do come fall um, to impound that water and give that space for the fresh water to come in and, and mix. And I think this group also, Bill made a, a really good comment um, last week about you know, how we get better mixing coming out of Bear River. Um, and he had suggested maybe a dike between like Fremont and Promontory or something like that. And I think after having more discussions, you know, I think there's a lot of different structures that could potentially help with that mixing um, or divert water to, you know, go around Fremont Island and maybe have more time in the South Arm uh, to do its thing. And I think, you know, one thing that I would like to investigate a little bit further is what benefits we get off of both evaporation but also concentrations that go through the breach. So I think these are the kind of conversations that you know this this group is really well poised to to answer. So um, that that's really the only update I have. But I I guess um, with the ever changing situation, it's been really hard to adopt that protocol because I think it was you know so prescriptive and there were a lot of things that weren't left out. I don't think we expected this to get you know to scour off so much and, and drop so much. And now that we're left with the situation. We, we probably need to react to that. And I think as we develop that protocol, you know, for the long-term management of this, we probably need to reconcile some of these things that will happen in big water years and how wave action, you know, changes the berm. So I, I think, again, the, the, all this data that we're collecting is helping us to figure out what we're going to do. But being a moving target, I, I appreciate everybody's patience with uh, with us being able to make a decision, but I think nature's taken pretty good care of us this year. So pretty happy with the way things have gone. But then that's, and if I that's can it. Yeah. throw in there, I actually really appreciate your patience as well. I know some of the holdup has been getting the commissioner position filled as well as evaluating. We're still in that evaluation position, just being very honest. But I, I really appreciate the good data you're providing. I think an interesting observation from Andy is that we're actually not seeing a return flow north to south, even with an opening that's several feet. At yeah. least at its deepest, which I think is interesting for management objectives in the future. Yeah, that, that's been sure. another realization too. Is I think it, I think there's a really big advantage to remain or to to keeping the elevation slightly different than the south and the north, and keeping that positive pressure um, going through the entire causeway. Because we know now from observations this uh, this year that we're leaking through the old culverts, and there's you know there's a lot of flows. And from my understanding, those flows are heading north. Um, and so I think that's a good thing. If we can keep that pressure, keeping water moving that way, not keeping the heavier brands from coming back in all of the openings, um, that should be another goal that we try to achieve with our, you know, with modifying this. And I think that does tie into elevations, but those are those are some major benefits. Do we know at what elevation um, that interface would be? I'm not sure I understand the question. The, the interface between the hyper saline northern water and the, is that what you're talking about, Andrew? Yeah, yeah. There was three and a half feet of difference or so. 3.7. Yeah. 
from surface of north to south. Yeah. Surface, yeah, we, surface. With the berm, we don't know because we haven't seen it come through. I don't think. I think well, observations at the, at the breach suggest that there it's just dominated by south storm. Yeah, but I think like Andrew, your your question is like maybe if there's only a foot, we're still going to get right. seshes that push north arm brines in, and then also where that positive head pressure comes in from like through the causeway. And I think those are things that maybe we ought to invest in some additional monitoring, like maybe through the culverts, look at, you know, if that's even measurable, but try to understand, you know, where, where that exists. So we know what we want to maintain, what that, you know, that elevation difference looks like. So if there's suggestions on how we can do that, we do have that funding that's for burn modifications and, and kind of that whole management of that situation. And I think that uh, additional measuring and research uh, going into that is something that we could, you know, spend some of that funding on, especially if we're not going to go in and physically mo uh, modify the berm, we could invest into trying to better understand some of those connections. So if, if you have any suggestions, Andrew, on how we might do that, we could, we could look at that. And I think USGS is probably really well placed to, to do some of that. You know, and just, just an observation, this, this berm was basically pit run stuff. Was they just hauled it out there and threw it in the hole? Um, if you did a little more engineering on it, it might change the permeability and it would improve the resistance to erosion. What happened here is it got up high, you flushed out some small stuff and allowed some of the other stuff to slump. And I think, you know, we did an ad hoc, quick and dirty berm. If you really intend to control this, you need to have, you know, some layering and put some armoring on the back to hold it in place to do a more civil type design on this thing. I mean, I would say though, they, they did, they did engineer it. It just it didn't. It was. <laughs> yeah. It, it was, just wasn't. Um, it, was, it wasn't done in a way that we reduced the permeability. I mean, I think it's the and, very smallest. We and it was a temporary berm. Yeah. I I understand that. But if you if you're on with that, if you want to keep that berm at a stable level, you've got to do more construction engineering. Mm -hmm. And right. the other observation, while you're getting nothing back north to south, you've got a three foot difference, and then you've got the base of that berm is so wide, the resistance flow through the bottom part of that berm. Is going to be naturally slower, and and that's why you're seeing almost none because you got a, a big dam at the bottom and a narrower dam at the top. So I, I think it's only natural to expect you're not going to get any flow yeah. because of the width of the base of your. Well, we're missing from the cascade to the, from the south to north. It's still so sure. You're still rolling some dikes and stuff. Well, and I think that's that's probably the key thing here. Like it wasn't wasn't necessarily designed to be a weir. Yeah. <laughs> it was designed to be a berm. Yeah. that it would stop flow. I was going to be at that point from a modeling perspective. You know, if you're trying to model it as a weir, but you're getting these big carve outs in it, like yeah. that's just going to make. That's a V weir. Well, the modeling. <laughs> sure, is it, rate, is it a rated V not weir? No, exactly. I'm sure. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. You can do that. <laughs> I can't tell if Craig is on there, but, um, but I know that the modeling through the breach right now is like almost, it, it's not really speaking well with what they would expect and that's exactly why but i do think that we should that's another thing that maybe we should investigate is you know i know that when we originally started talking about this the cadillac version that had adjustable head gates and things was like 70 million dollars sure. but maybe we can look at some um, engineering fixes that are maybe a little more rudimentary that, that just work better and that actually give us the consistent results so i think that'd be interesting for this group who has you know, pretty good experience in other systems. What would be possible in, a, in an environment like this? Well, I, th I think speaking of data, I know Christine's been going through a lot of that data, and and I know Craig and Layla have been also working hard to try to interpret the data that we have. And I think, as as Ben said, uh, you know, trying to estimate, come up with a a model of the flow through or over that weir has been extremely challenging. Um, you know, it, it's, I think there, it, you can't generalize it. I mean, we've, I've plotted the, the points, Christine just sent it to me yesterday and and it, it's just a complete scatter plot. <laughs> There's no relationship. So I think, um, anyway, before, I think one of the key things that, um, before we get into that, I want to step back a minute, though, and just go back to our discussion last month, because one of the key requests that Joe had was, um, as we were talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, how we calculate the salinity, the average volume-weighted salinity of the south arm. So how do we 
how do we incorporate the deep brown layer into those calculations? And what difference does that make? And the numbers that we've had this year <coughs> included a definable deep brown layer. Um, but the question was, is, well, what if we use this same method and um, previous data where we did have a definable uh, deep brown layer? And so that's something we asked Christine to look at last month. And um, if you could talk us through that. Very helpful. Yes, Krishna, you have your hand up. Ed, we can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> if you can type or comment in. Um, we're we're going to revisit the flow through over the berm here in a little bit. Um, you can get get that. Why don't you talk okay. about we start this microphone out? So I followed um, the same approach that we've kind of gone over the last couple of meetings, basically saying um, this volume weighted approach where we have a measured concentration in the upper bar. Okay. Samples are collected right about here, and then um, estimating how much volume that concentration measurement represents, and then um, also taking our deep sample, which represents the deep brine layer when present, attributing a volume to that, and calculating a, what we call a volume weighted concentration for the whole cell farm. So I went back into um, our records, uh, and here's just an example from November of 2018. So this was a month when we had a deep brine layer, as shown here, you can see there's a huge jump in salinity between shallow and deep samples. And I calculated the volume weighted concentration using all of the depths. And the, the value that you get using that approach is 140 grams per liter. If you exclude the deep brine layer, so just looking at the upper brine concentration and volume, then you get about 135 grams per liter. So that illustrates that difference there. Um, taking another example, May of 2019, so that one was fall, here we're looking at spring. Similar thing, um, there is a decrease when you exclude the deep brine layer. So just to give you a sense of how much that is, in this case, it's about seven grams per liter. So there is a difference when we exclude the deep brine layer concentration. And I looked at um, our historical record from 2010 to present. So I was able to take this information from the SALT study that we've been working on. And I wanna um, just clarify one discrepancy, which is that the rubric that is outlined by this committee is that we wanted to take the upper brine as defined by the oxic layer, um, so that that's you know supportive to the brine shrimp. In this case, the interface <laughs> between upper brine and deep brine layer was determined using specific connectivity, and it would have been quite a bit of work to go back and reassign all those layers using um, dissolved oxygen of the interface layer. So just so you're all aware of that discrepancy. But here we're, um, we're plot this is a volume weighted cell farm salinity in grams per liter. The purple dots represent using all the depths of upper brine and deep brine layer samples. The, um, the green triangles represent just using that upper brine layer. And so, and then on the secondary y-axis, this axis on the right is just the difference between those. So the discrepancy in concentration between those two um, calculation approaches. And that, that ranges from zero to about 10 grams per liter, fluctuating with conditions of the deep brine, how stratified they are, et cetera. So does that answer the questions that we had? I think that shows the difference that that makes. Um, does that answer your, does that answer your question, Joe? I think that, that was the key, key question. And, and I guess just, and, and the protocol and the rubric that we have, um, in the fall, we are looking at the entire depth. We're coming up with an average volume weighted concentration that looks at the entire flow depth. And then what we have decided is that for the spring, um, that the brine shrimp cysts, the artemia cysts, are really the target. For, uh, that's the critical endpoint that we're trying to protect. And they are most likely only located in the upper brine layer above the, any present, any deep brine layer. And so we would only look at the I have a question on microbialites. Um, where where would that layer be? They yeah. uh, upper brine. Upper brine. Maybe well. shallow. Okay. Yeah. Bill, 
Yeah, I just want to weigh in on the terminology here. Um, I understand that we need to uh, be concerned with the oxygen content, but the distinction between the deep brine layer and the upper brine layer needs to be based on the, the density, the salinity, and not be tied to the oxygen content because you can get suboxic to anoxic conditions even for the relatively low density layer driven. Yeah, you know. Sorry? We lost your I think audio. Our speaker, Jim, yeah. the red light's just. Hey, Bill, just a second. We can't hear you a second. Sorry about that. It was just the best part. To, to, <laughs> you're getting to the meat of it, and uh, now we're just hanging out there. Might just be our speaker here. That's the problem. He's the smartest guy in the room. All kinds of technical glitches today. We used to have meetings like in person. I know, right? The good old days, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um. So I, I think Bill, Bill, you're making a very good point, and I know I remember back. Bill should be able to speak. Can you, Bill, can you try again? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I would propose that we call the oxic layer that. Don't call it the upper brine layer because we'll start mixing definitions, and I think it's going to cause confusions down the road. Okay. Noted. So in this case, Bill, it would be upper brine because I did use specific conductivity to determine that interface. In the future, we've asked GSLEP to record the interface based on the changes in dissolved oxygen. So in that in case it's moving forward, we can use that terminology of oxygen there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on this? Um, no. Let's move on. Do you want me to keep going? Or? Yeah, I'd say, yeah, I guess just a quick intro. So um, based upon the information that we have, we've been trying to figure out how how can we best make a decision? How can we inform a decision as to what to do with a berm? And um, and so as we noted, we've been, well, why don't you just go ahead? You got a lot of great information there. Okay, well, I'm we happy, I mean, I've got to admit that it was a lot of back and forth between Jeff and I this weekend, so please chime in at any yeah, time. We're yeah. trying to figure out what is the data, what story does the data tell us? Yeah. Um, is what we're trying to do. So um, Jeff asked me to just kind of recap everybody on the projected fall and spring salinity. And so I updated these using our most recent measurements taken on August 17th. So um, a new concentration of 138 grams per liter and adjusted lake elevation through the same mass balance equation that we've used previously. Um, and then kind of a similar approach for the spring. And, uh, and I'm happy to go through the methodology if needed, but the, the kind of the final output of this for three different berm heights um, ranges, the salinities for the fall range from about 140 to 135 grams per liter. And what these different berm heights do is they allow for a different export of water from south to north. This is based on um, an estimate that that Jeff had shared with me previously. So for no change in berm height, you know, looking at 139 grams per liter, you were to drop it a few feet, looking at 135. So just so that that's clear, it, you know, your volumes will decrease in the south arm based on the amount of water you're exporting, and that will transport mass to the north arm and reduce salinity slightly. In the spring, this is all, you know, quite honestly a guessing game, but I am using climate and flow data average conditions from 2012 to 2022 in these projections and um, salinity estimates range from 121 to 100, around 120 grams per liter. And compared to the objectives that are set in the rubric, um, these conditions would satisfy both of those, assuming that they are correct. Um, and then there's a few other discussion items that we can just jump into. Jeff had kind of asked me to plot a number of different things to just help everyone think about um, sort of the effects of, of dropping the berm or of, of creating a void space in the south arm that you would fill with fresh water. So there's a number of 
of slides that go through those. Christine? Go ahead, Bill. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Thomas. I noticed that these are a little bit different from what you presented last time. Yes. Is that... So this is because I, I used our August um, 17th measurements. Okay. So I'm no longer assuming any condition for July or the beginning Perfect. of August. So they're just kind of more updated um, to the most recent data we have. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Bill, interesting. Bill, I just coming back. Yeah, Christine, I um, just want to make sure I understand um, the mechanics of what you're doing. And if I understand correctly, the primary impact on salinity is how much room you make for inflow uh, to mix into the system in, during the runoff season. Is that correct? That's my hunch. I mean, yes. Okay. Okay. There, there's a lot of mass exported. The mass export is relatively small, such that, that I don't expect that that's what's really decreasing salinity. It is this oh, dilution. Fair enough. OK, that's why it isn't having a huge effect, is we can only move so much to the north arm, and that's what's limiting that impact. OK, thanks. That's very clear now. So how much how much is the salinity effect with a, about a two-foot difference in your calculation? It's about three, it's, three ppp, or yeah. three grams per liter? Yeah, it's not more much. Or less. Yes. No, it's five, it's very even five grams per liter. And, and, and it's not insignificant, though. So and be very foot. careful with that because that equation I used for flow over that berm assumed a, a flat berm queer and a smooth queer. No, no, I understand that. But from, from a perspective of management, if we were able to have that smooth weir, from a perspective of management, it's still a five, um, five grams per meter difference mm -hmm. over a one year period. So it does help with management. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you, I'm, I'm the simple guy here. The south arm salt load is about, what, 11 billion tons of salt, something in that range? Um, it's about 1.1 billion-ish. 1.1 billion. -ish. That's lower than I thought. Because when I took that calculation of about 1,000 cubic feet per second across that weir, if you did that all year long, you would export about 25 million tons of salt. Okay. If you're a mineral extractor of the size of compass or US magnesium, you're pulling in 25 million tons of salt each year or in that same sort of range. So mineral extraction is taking twice as much salt out of the lake as we're exporting to the north arm under the current, current regimen. So I just thought that was an interesting observation. By pulling the salt level down, you're in, if you let the extraction go, you're going to get more salt out of the lake than just running the burn. I don't think that's true, Tom, because you're take you're evaporating the water and then you bring the bitterns back in. So no, you're we're taking. Not. We don't, not at all. Martin does. Yeah, but they're little they're little guys by comparison. They're a million tons. Compass does. Over yeah, time, we're not, we're not doing it very that. well. I'll tell you that. It's, no, it's, no, it's okay. nominal. It's nominal. But we don't but do it. No, we never do. I don't. I think that's disingenuous. I think you're taking the water out, as well as the salt. You're taking the same amount of water and transporting it to the north as we're taking from the south and putting it in a place where the salt won't be there for the salinity of the lake. So I have a hard time with the disingenuous label. How many acre feet did you guys evaporate this year? How much did you pump into your pumps? On a on a good year, we pumped forty billion gallons. This year, what an acre feet? What is uh, or nine is our and then, like this year, I know it was considerably less. But yeah, we agreed to only take fifteen percent of that from a, you know agreement between us and voluntary agreement. Yeah. So this year, we hardly took any salt out of the lake. But on an average year, we're taking as much salt out of the lake as we're transporting through the berm right now. Well, because because just if we're flowing a thousand acre feet per uh, second, excuse me, thousand uh, CFS. Over four months, that's going to end up in, in, you know near two hundred thousand acre feet or something similar to that. Well, so okay. I mean that, that's quite a bit more no. water than what you guys. I just did a thousand average. cubic feet and did the calculation. It's almost dead on what we do in a year. Are you sure? Uh, I think your math might be a little funny. Help me out, Chris. a thousand cubic feet per second over twenty-four hours, hours a day and three hundred sixty-five days. It's, I think that's, that's over two hundred thousand acre feet. What was it? In four months, in 120 yeah. days. It's about, about 50,000 gallons a minute, right? 
I mean, I, I, I actually literally just looked at it on the calculator with the uh, water rights okay. and a 933 CFS, it ends up being uh, a total of 1,849 acre feet per day. So if you look at that over 120 days, you're well over, you're like 225,000 acre, acre feet a day. Like 18, this, 1, this Here's a plot of it. Yeah, so I, I, this, I plotted, so that plot on the right hand side, I was just trying to gauge, um, you know, if if the brown, if we're only flowing 200 CFS, which I think was the low point we measured the spring, or first, and then the other end of the bracket was 900, which is what I remembered, the high number that we measured. And I just looked at, well, what if we flowed that over 120 days? How many? How many thousands of acre feet could, could we move over a four month period? What have you got? Um, just over 200,000 acre feet. Mm -hmm. So that's about over four months. That's about the same as total mineral extraction taken. Jeff, if I can, if I can add, um, we've only been operating one pump. You may recall over, over time we, we can run 10 pumps. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that relates to uh, ballpark 30,000 acre feet if you did that over a year. Um, we don't do it over a year, it's probably half of that. So th th that's where we are coming to the West Pond. Um, that's so, so I'm off by factor perhaps of two. So we're getting 50% of what's going through that room. But, but I think Tom, I, I think your point is duly noted is that, um, you know, we have been focused on the berm. That's the role of the salinity committee. And I think your point is that as we're trying to export salt, to the north arm, we're exporting water to the north arm, and you're making the comparison that, uh, and similarly, you are taking water and salt out of the, the south, south, arm. south arm. And so I, I think that comparison certainly is instructive to give us some, you know, relative. Yeah, the impact of mineral extraction has been vilified recently in various ways, that's what my routine. But you could almost look like, you could almost take it as we're adding some dilute water by taking the salt out well and i, I would maybe say like i, I agree you guys remove salt from the system. For that. however when we send water to the north arm and we're precipitating you know salt out of the the north arm it's also you know sequestering salt in a way oh, it is. when we might need it later like who knows what we're going to look like in 30 years if we get and you know when we restore lake bonneville we might need that salt and so. frankly <laughs> frankly no right. extraction. The BBB is still available. Bring the bottom book back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all in favor of that. Another 500 feet where we're sitting. <laughs> but, I, but I just, I just think that there's, there's trade-offs, and I think it's, it's good. I think it's good to identify that. And I honestly, I think it would be worthwhile um, to, to, you know, to try to quantify and understand how much salt you guys are sequestering in that, and what it looks like versus, you know, and how it works with the different mineral companies. Because I think this argument comes up just about every salinity committee. And I think you and Thomas have the same conversation. And so I think if we were able to put a, a cap on this and understand that better, we would all be better suited but to be able to make better I decisions. Offer, if I could offer towards that, Ben, um, yeah. you know, we sell, we sell to the market ballpark of two, two and a half million tons of salts. So that exits, mm -hmm. we sequester about 30 million tons when we're kind of, when we're pumping on all cylinders. Um, so it's sequestered in the ponds. Now that's still the lake bed. I mean, it's, it's not lost to the lake bed. It's just sequestered. Um, Tom's operation is, you know, the same size as ours roughly, but they have half the concentration, probably half the salt. So you're probably talking a sequestration of 40 to 50 million tons, but ballparking. And and the floors in a solar pond, if you get to a dilute solution, like where you want some salt, you just pump some fresh water in and let it flow back out. Yeah. And you're adding the salt back to control on the low end. I, I do think it's important to realize though, like both of your leases are on lake bed and they're not, we may not, I mean, who knows how long you'll, will be around. So essentially it's kind of a similar idea of what we're doing in the North Arm, but the North Arm sequesters in a, in a location that will always probably lack the South Arm characteristics in the life. Whereas if we had to reclaim your ponds, we'd have a salt crest that would, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, just because it's sequestered in your pond doesn't mean it's not on lake bed. Like, if you guys get uh, that's, that's, that, that's why I use the word sequester. It's yeah. not, it's not, it doesn't exit the system. Um, it's just temporarily. But it's sequestered in the south arm now, rather than the north arm, because your ponds are on the south arm. So I think there's a. No, there's a. Well, like on all your ponds that are on our Bear River Bay, okay. that's sequestered. That's the that's where your interstitial brand is, right? 
I mean, it's on both, it's on both sides. Yeah. So, but I think yeah. that what I'm saying is like, it's not gone out of the system. Oh, yeah. If yeah. Compass walks away and you have to restore those those dikes, we have a lot of salt that's in the South Arm now it, that it, wouldn't have been there. It's just sequestered. I mean, you yeah. know, in, in that, you know, end of life of operation, mm -hmm. the state, you know, and the operator can choose, of course. you know, what, whether or not to, to yeah. operate that. And then I'm, you know, sort of thinking yeah. about that from an operational day-to-day -day standpoint. Now. I think what I'm suggesting though is that I think that because this comes up so often, I think it would be interesting to understand how much salt is leaving the system versus what it would look like if we simply didn't evaporate the water. Because if that argument's going to be something that we want to, you know, hang our hat on, it would be really interesting well, to know what that's, that. It's a pretty works. good analog to what's going through the north right, right, sure. right now. And I, and I think actually our the, our original research plan in 2019 that was one of the, mm -hmm. the studies was to to try to nail that down. Because what is that salt mass that is in storage? You know, because we're trying to understand what is the overall salt mass of the lake and where is the salt? And as we yeah. develop our salinity management plan, which I think is going to be, ob obviously this is the group that's going to be the most, you know, crucial for that. I think that identifying, you know, some of those uh, questions that we need to investigate further so we can make intelligent management decisions. I mean, that's that's probably what we're going to need to do. No, yeah. Because there's obviously economic issues here which mm -hmm. we're not discussing in this technical committee. No, but, that's but when you get a salinity management plan, you got to look at the economics of uh, I say mean, five percent of the alfalfa that goes out of the base. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd argue that that's not the place for the salinity plan. I think that we need to look at the salinity, and then the economics need to end up in like I mean, that's like Brian's shop and, and exactly. You know the, <laughs> the folks that are going to make those decisions. But all we can do is say like this is from a salinity standpoint. This is what we need to be doing. But I, yeah, the politics well, and how you get that salinity has options, and they sure. have different impacts. No Let's give Andrew Andrew head oh, hand up. Now for a <laughs> Andrew, you still have a question? Sure. I was just get, on these projections, Christine. I was just wondering what the timing was for the berm height. Is that assuming that the berm height is changed today through sometime in the spring next year? What's what's the timing on that? I guess is what I'm asking. That's a good question, Andrew. I think it essentially is immediate. Um, so 4192, obviously no change. 4190, it kind of assumes that that is the broom height. And then in my calculations, I assume that we raise up the broom again at the end of February and that flow is essentially cut off after that point. So it raises back up to 4192? Raises up to a point where we're trapping the water. All fresh such water? That export is no longer going, just okay. mimicking what we did last year. That's what these calculations do. If, if, if I can just add a, just one more piece of context. Um, I don't like mentioning it, but House Bill 513, that there is a provision in there that says when late conditions have normalized, the expectation is to have connect, reestablish connection to, to between South and North. Sure. And I'll tell you, you know, maybe I'm premature on, on a vote sort of thing, but a 4189 elevation in, in, in my mind would, would achieve that, you know, that, that charge. Um, and, you know, releasing 300 and some thousand, 378, thousand acre feet into into the north arm, you know, in, in this low lake level context would, would be helpful I and mean, we could time we could time our, our extraction during uh, a, a period I think, we, no you, I think we are releasing I mean the plan right now if we simply left it where it's at is the this flow to the north arm is going to continue until February. So we have that, you know, those almost um, I mean, that's more than the 120 days that we're talking to get to 225,000 acre feet. I don't know that we'll float, we'll keep the 933 CFS going, but I think that's something to monitor and try to determine like what we are flowing over. And then as far as returning to normal conditions, I think like, uh, normal conditions, I don't think have been defined yet, right? Like we want to be within that zone of that you know, I think we've just defined that as 120 to 160 grams per liter. But I just want to remind the group of, of, of that, yeah. of that provision in, in 513, because, you know, I appreciate Thomas saying, well, five grams per liter is, is meaningful, um, but just we don't get to a place where, uh, you know, it's, it's only a couple grams per liter, it's not worth it. Um, but that, that, that is the charge, and, you know, and that there, there are stakeholder, um, uh, you know, concerns, you know, with, with keeping it. Yeah, and I think, well, I know that's recognized because we've talked about that the flip side concern is getting the salinity too low. And if, if the salinity starts to get too low as the lake comes back up, 
optimistically. Now, now we we are we may be flipped into the other situation where we need to get salt back um, to the south. Island. How how far away are we from that? You see that? I think I mean, we had the best winter ever. We put a berm up, right? We brought what? Four? Is that both? Are the yeah, we one point two feet? Well, yeah, no one. Yeah. No, no, I know that, but I'm saying in terms of from one eighty to one thirty. Yeah, right. Right. Which is about thirty three percent reduction. Yeah. Yeah. Right, which is significant. Yeah. Well, but it would take how many winters like that? I mean, exact same conditions. One more. Well, one. Yeah. yeah. We, but we're, I think right now we're in, uh, like, as far as I'm concerned, right now the, it looks like we're going to be in really good shape yeah. next year, almost perfect. Right. But if, but I think that this all depends on how much we capture this fall. Because if we don't capture anything and we like we skim off that freshwater lens and it just spills to the north, then we might have actually done more damage than we did good by having the berm there. So I think we need to evaluate that and try to understand what that's going to look like. But I, but just because we have, one year where we were within that threshold, I think we need to be able to demonstrate that that it's that the effect is there. And so I don't know. I'm not suggesting that we have that answer right now, but I don't think we're ready to like you know knock the berm down to 4187 and, and call it a day. Because I think there's just there's probably a lot more that needs to go into that. What, what I'm saying though, then is 89 as as Christine's model mm -hmm. um, would, would, would be helpful to a north you know north arm stakeholder. Yeah. But I think that's where we're at by yeah. default, isn't it? Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's close. Like we're, we're practically there already, unless we're, I mean, we might be talking like half a foot. On the northern? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, for the berm there, but um, oh, as far as that, also, right. yeah. that also assumes that we go down, so if we say we're at 4189 today and we're flowing that over, uh, you know, we're assuming that in February we're popping it back up to 4192 or maybe even more to make sure we're capturing those slopes. But if we're only putting off 200,000 acre feet into the north arm, we're not the south arm elevation. We'd have to go up way higher than 4192 to cap capture all the inputs. Like under this circumstance, we're not going to drop that much more. We're probably not even, we may not even get down below. We might be like 4191 and some change at the end of the season. So, so there's not really that much room to capture water. I mean, there's, there's only one, yeah. two more weeks of evaporation. Well, exactly. So we that's but, but exactly it won't be 91. Point. It won't be 91. No, it'll be like it might like not even go below. So, okay, so two and a half. Yeah. Publicly, the compass is advocating for 4189. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's, it's a trade-off, but I mean. Well, Joe, you know, like a release and a reconnection. You know what I'm saying, though, right? This is the, but you're, the, but you're, you're hitting, you're, you're explaining that exactly. What I'm trying to explain is that right now, if we don't go below 4192, there's no room to capture additional fresh water, as Christine's model suggests. So those benefits that we see on that right-hand column there, that's only if we're capturing all the fresh water. So we would have so to that, put a berm up to like 4195 or you know something like that to capture that to capture. So this is for the runoff so this exactly. is a perfect, that's a perfect segue into what we were talking about i guess i think in the slides that she has here is because as because I, I know you know christine and layla and craig and then how do we estimate how much water we can get over this burn and with some confidence all we can know is here's what we've measured it's happened in the past trying to predict what's going to happen is is extremely difficult and so we we were like, well, maybe maybe let's let's change the story, the question we're trying to answer, because we we know that by moving the berm, we can we you know thank thank goodness our projections are we're within where we want to be, right? I think that's important number point number one. But I think important point number two is that if we drop the berm, you know we're not making huge changes in, in the salinity. We're not exporting a whole lot of salt to the north arm. And so then the, so then if we change the question to say, well, how can we make a difference? And and this is where this now we're talking about how do we dilute? Mm -hmm. And so how do we, you know, to, to maximize our dilution factor is, is we have to have headspace, uh, storage space on the south arm behind the berm to be able to to do that. That's where we that's where the magic happened this year. Um, and and if we were to leave the berm at 4192 and the lake only drops to 4191 point something, we don't have a whole lot of storage volume there anymore. We'll still see some dilution with inflows coming in next spring, 
but we're not going to see the the big change that we saw this year. And so that that was where. So I think those were your next slides, right? Yep. I think we want to be with 120. I mean, that would put us in a position where the end of the operation is for me. But there's. These are just sort of things that you think about. Well, why don't you go through the those things? So there. So anyway, I guess the. What we what we've been struggling with is well how can we what kinds of information can help us if we can't come with an up with absolute numbers if you know any if even a guesstimate is difficult um, how can we kind of bracket this so we can kind of understand what the different factors are and so that's what I mean, Christine put together a number of slides just helping us under you know answer some of these other questions. Okay. Well, can I just make one comment on your last slide that. Those numbers on the right, those are absolutely, you know, closer to where we want to be. Um, maybe even still on the high end of where we want to be in the spring, because we're gonna in a normal year, you know, we're coming up so much higher. The, at the end of in the fall of the like 2024, that would still put us at like 150, 155 grams per liter, and we're right on that cusp of being too high again. So I think whatever we can do this year to push us down below that spring salinity of 120 grams per liter is where we should be try to go to anyway it would be helpful then to get to get the bathymetry yeah on, on that course. opening no, i think we're all waiting on the, you know hinged on you, that because i mean you know yeah. anything i'm saying is speculative if, if it's yeah. already achieving that right mm -hmm. no and i think largely that's that's going to be a big decision point for everyone so i think that it makes sense to wait to make these decisions until we have that information but i think we need to start thinking about what it looks like Okay, so just some other factors to consider as we're mulling all this. Time. So, um, if we were to export a certain volume of water to the north arm, this is just giving us a sense of how much drop in south arm elevation we would expect. So, for 200,000 acre feet, for example, that's about half a foot drop in south arm. And to get to 200,000 acre feet, as we kind of talked about previously, and then you'd need 120 days of 900 CFS over the berm to get to something like that. So if our condition now stays the same for the next four months, a certain thousand acre feet, a drop of half a foot in the cell phone, just to give you a sense. And then just to, in context, that's why I was asking, just to clarify that we've had six, about 60 days so far of at least 900 CFS um, going over that berm. And so if that's the case, you know, we've already moved about 100,000 acre feet um, over the last few months. Mm -hmm. If we continue with the berm as is, I mean, the flow is going to drop as the south arm water level drops. Um, but but we we could be you know on the order of 50 to 100,000 acre feet over the next two months, and then if we left the berm as is through February, that that would add another three months of flow that would be moving over. So when you start to add that up, I think we're getting closer to that 400. Potential, I mean, three to four hundred thousand acre feet of water being moved to the north arm over, is it's not even over this calendar year. It's not yeah, over the runoff season, right? Assuming the burn remains static where it is today, like it has the last right. two months. Yeah, yeah. that or it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but but the key, I think the key, I and mean, this goes back to what Ben was saying early on, is that the berm is, you know has naturally corrected itself to allow for what we are, I guess our protocol called for, was if we are within those targets, then then the, the berm has done its job and we can lower the berm to move some water to the north arm um, to address Compass's question or concern. And then, then the benefit is that then we raise the berm back up to 4192 so we have, we can dilute. Um, so anyway, this I guess this is just trying to get at, um, you know, as we're moving water around, what kinds, you know, what's happening in the south arm. And then, then I, I would also just say too, another thing that we should consider as we're talking about this is when we raise the berm again, because last year when we raised the berm, you know, we caught all that early, fresh, you know, that early season water, and I don't know if that's the, you know, that water's coming in so slow. I think it has a better chance to mix if we waited uh, to raise the berm until later in the season. Perhaps we could mitigate some of that fresh water that's coming out of the Bear River and right in there. So maybe if we looked at like, you know, doing construction in the, the, the end of March, maybe we would have a better effect to capture more of that and mitigate some of that effect of that water going right around the corner. 
Well, then how much, I mean, this is the actual question. I mean, people were making best guesses last year, right? How much data do we have to inform when? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, we have, March. I think we're April. No. Yeah, I think we're heavy, we're heavy on data, and we have a lot of, USGS is collecting data, we have a lot of good data points for our salinity. I mean, it's, we're still fairly fresh in this paradigm, though, where we have these, yeah. so year or two of data, I mean, it's uh, I mean, a lot to go off of. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not officially part of y'all, so I, I apologize for weighing in. I'm, I'm just curious, though, if we say, put the burn up in March, what do we lose? What do we gain? Yeah, those are the kind of things I think we need to model because, and I think the as we start entering into the you know the the winter and we look at what our snowpack is looking like, we can make some of those decisions because if by January we just had a dismal winter that's just not showing up, then we probably want to get the berm up quick and capture that water. But if it seems like it's going to be like last year's, uh, then maybe we want to let water flow for a longer period of time and get some it's, of that runoff. Like last water. year's. Yeah, stock in Joel Perry, I guess. Yeah, so Perry does. But no, I think that these, these, it really is, we don't have enough data to be able to, to do this intelligently right now. So I think we do have to make observations of the conditions and then try to make decisions based on what we have available. So yeah. I've got a media interview real fast and I'll be back. Thanks. I'll have fun. Oh, yeah. You know, and the other thing, when you have wet years, you know, I'm a 40 year guy in the lake here. The lake bottoms out in the end of September, first part of October, and starts up early. So you may get your flow sooner than you expect. Yeah. I think that it's an important the timing question is an important one too. Yeah. Is that you know, if you're a, you know, I love Tom's analogy of a bucket, if you have a bucket of salt water, you know, if you if you, you're wanting to put more fresh water into that bucket to dilute the salt, you know, does it matter if it happens you know in December or if it happens in um, in May you know the if you, um, you know any extra water is gonna end up going over anyway um, so I think which kind of gets to this is you know I guess the, the question that I was coming to is how lucky do we feel <laughs> in terms of this winter's precip because if we, you know, how far do we want the stuff on to drop to create the storage that we want? And, um, yeah, go ahead, Christine. And, and so this was, I think, striking to Jeff and I that, okay, you're transporting 200,000 acre feet, but it takes four months. But then I wanted to back up to our conditions in 2016, right after the breach was opened. And this was when we had a, a just like about a meter head difference between the, the south and the north. This is right after, you know, this is essentially right after the, the room was opened and just the cumulative volume. And so if you're in the extreme case, if you just were to remove the berm, you can actually move water pretty quickly. Um, Turn thousand acre feet in 20 days. So just wanted to put that into perspective that if you really wanted to go for it, the physics are there to transport a lot of water and a lot of salt mass very quickly, much more quickly than four months. Um, and then getting back to this question of headspace and if you you know, drop it half a foot or, or how do we, and we decide how much water is needed to refill the stop farm. And so here we are at 40, around 41.92, if you were to drop it to 41.91, how much water do we need to get back up to that point um, to 41.92, 400,000 acre feet. And then it kind of just gives you a sense of okay, I think what Jeff was saying, how much inflow do we need? How much do we expect? And how much rise in south farm would be expected? And of course, this is assuming that south farm is sort of contained. So the bathymetry that I'm using here is just for South Farm. So it's assuming all water out of here would be contained in the South Farm, which is likely not true because it will be good. But just to give you a sense of what that like. And that, then but I think I guess that the key point there is that you know if our burn is already close to 4189 and we do move you know three to four hundred thousand acre feet to the north arm this year, and um, and then we were to bring the berm back up to 4192, we're going to need a, a winter that generates 1.1 million acre feet of, of inflow to the lake to be able to get it back up to fill that, that berm height of 4192. Plus no evaporation. Right. So, yes, this, so this is, this is just strictly <laughs> so what we have. So you're going to need more than that. Right. 
and, and, I, and I think that's that's where the question of you know how lucky do we feel comes in is you know if we have I mean this winter we had an epic winter snowpack um, but we only had 2.2 only 2.2 million acre feet of inflow to but, the lake. But, I mean we, we filled up every reservoir, including that, that was exactly. you know, including severely. And re resaturated our soil. Resaturated the soil. So, I mean, it, it, it's teed up, exactly. you know, well, yeah. you know, or even an average year. Yeah. So, those are, I, I think, but I think those are the, those are the risks. I think when we're, when we're trying to manage something like this, we're trying to identify, well, what are the risks? What could go wrong? Well, as we try to achieve or provide a benefit. Now, I still think that we need to look at the last couple of decades and the trend has been the drought, and that's, I think, the trend we need to take, unless there's a good reason to believe that that's changing. I mean, we had 2011, we had 2017 with the Great Spring, you know, right now we have 2022-23. The trend is still a downward trend. Anecdotally, it was interesting. We used to go through more cycles, where if you had wet, seem to be more of a wet cycle whereas if you go look at this the last decade plus right it's just it's these one-offs yeah. but it's hard to predict right the great El, have an El Nino is going to give you three wet years you don't know yeah. and I, I think so if I the 90s, right, it did in the it, 80s it didn't in the 90s yeah if I remember right I think the average in the flow to the to the lake in the last 10 years was 1.9 million acre feet I remember because that when I look at 2.2 .2 this year versus the average of the last 10 years of 1.9, it's kind of like, oh, <laughs> we didn't get as much as we could have. But as you said, we were such a deficit. Such a deficit, and that's been corrected. Yeah, the really, really dry sponge we had to fill before it you know, overflowed to the lake. Yeah, I think there is, from what I've heard on climate prediction, the, this period of city shows that like we could expect a couple of at least average years. And I think that that's something to, to really be excited about because like you said, the sponge is wet, you know, the reservoirs are full. The We're probably gonna, shouldn't be as long it, or exactly. steep as sort of sustained. So right? I, I feel pretty lucky. And I also think that all the, like I think our team here manifested that good water year. So if we just do what we did last year, <laughs> we'll probably uh, be able to get some similar results. So I, I think you put the burn back to 4192 <laughs> as soon as you can. <laughs> If you have more water, it'll overflow. If you have less, at least you captured some to retain. And I'd, I'd like that 4292 restored soon. I think you might have to go higher. And I'd be okay with higher too, but but then take it down afterwards. Well, and, and that, I think that's the exact point too, Tom. Is that if we if we were to say let's let's completely capture every drop of water, but we only do that until the, the day the spring runoff is concluded. So we get that better mixing and then take it down to the elevation that Joe's suggesting even. I mean, I think there's just, I think we lost such a, a we, we really missed out on not having to hire this year to get that. And I think we could have considered releasing water sooner had we had better mixing and understood that better. But like, mm -hmm. we didn't, I don't think we knew we were going to get the runoff here we had. And I think we didn't, there were a lot of unknowns, but we certainly missed a, an opportunity to really bring the salinity down higher. And I don't know the answer to this question. When's the last time the salinity was too low? In, in 19, when we flooded? 1999. So is that a risk? Is that a risk in our calculations at all? I mean, it was 7%, seven percent, seven and a half. Are we ever going to go after? Some more even lower, wasn't it wasn't lower like 87, 86? Conceptually, it, Thomas, no, that would be the average, but it dipped down to 75. And the lake was at 4212 essentially. Yeah, freshwater fish swimming around. And Mark, I think that I think there is some risk of that if sure you're engineering it to right. export salt, right? In the eighties. Um, yeah. I mean, it was a natural cycles. It's yeah. been forty years since that was a problem, right? I just wondered if that's something we should focus on and make sure that we calculate use that side of the calculation, or should we focus on making sure we have enough water and we stay dilute? Because took, the high side is our concern. Took four years of El Nino to get there. Well, I, I think we would have some pretty good warning indicators prior to getting there. Not right, like we would be able to get in a couple of years, like even under the conditions we had this year, and even under Christine's model of 
holding it all. We're still getting barely down to that lower threshold of where we want to be. So, well, to Mark's latter question, that's a much more remote risk than the high side risk, which is last summer where we really tested that high side. But for this amazing, you know, really robust water year, we'd be in crisis yeah. mode again right now, even with what we did on the burn. I don't I'm just know trying to what those numbers are. Thought process yeah. I mean, to, to my mind, I mean, the overriding concern remains that south arm salinity. Why? Because the, the the risks are just too high, right? If you get ESA petitions and all of this sort of stuff that can come from that. So that remains the overriding concern. Um, if those concerns can be addressed and we get back into safer levels, then you know, I think we have a state policy now. But the policy of the state, absent an overriding you know, salinity driver, is to have the berm open. So... We're trying to juggle those, but I think we're, we're we're still not too far removed from pretty good crisis last summer, right? Well, that, but I think I mean the point. Your point is a good one. Is when we're engineering the system, we have to be just thinking okay. about all the all of those different factors. And I, just to the point of the the state's statute right now, I'd say that you know the lake is communicating right now, and I think the only time there where it wasn't communicating is when it was completely blocked off. For so like if we were yeah, so if we were continuing to flow water to the north, even under normal conditions, I think we're still meeting the statutory requirement of the 513 to say, you know, the lake's commuting. It doesn't say which way it's communicating, it just That's says that there's connected. Exactly. Connected. So absolutely right. It can drag your kayak over part of it. I'd like to. That looks like a fun way to surf it over. It's fun until you crash in the north arm. Until you step out and get your kayak. Take a mouthful of the north arm. <laughs> okay, then this last slide is just a very simple um, exercise to say what happens if we just add 100, 200, 300,000 acre feet of fresh water to the condition registered at based off of right now, as of last Friday. Um, just to give you a sense, so we start on August 17th, the concentration is 138. Just if we add 100,000 acre feet of fresh water, this is the magnitude of change, about 2.2 grams per liter. Up to 300,000 acre feet, you get a dilution of about 6.4. Right? So right. Correct, really. Okay. But Jeff asked for this calculation of just instead of instead of thinking about you know how much mass are we exporting to the north arm and how much is that going to decrease salinity? What if we just isolate that dilution effect? and say, if we have head space in the south arm and fill that with fresh water, what kind of effect does that have? So this is kind of illustrating that mechanism. And it's a pretty strong effect, right? Yeah, I mean, Based this is how we get dilution each year. There's a ton of fresh water coming into the south arm, but um, yeah, this is, a very, I think, a very important uh, tool for the group to use to dilute some of the time. Anyway, that's, that's all I've got. Christine, would, yes. would SGS be willing to share that the same way you shared the previous um, presentation with the draft? Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. we, can you share it with the whole group? I'd like yeah, to. of course. But yes. So I guess the, the, in the absence of being able to answer the specific question that you have is how we step back from it and say, okay, well, how can we understand the situation better? And and so I think that's where what Christine just went through helps us try to understand, well, you know, if, if we're moving a lot of water, which it appears that we are, um, you know, what, how much, how much, well, if the berm is cut dropping, how much water are we moving? Um, and what could that do to the, the water level in the south arm? And so we can see that, you know, if we continue to move a couple hundred thousand acre feet over the next six months, um, the lake just by itself, the south arm will drop probably about a half a foot. Um, and so if, the, if it's down to 41.91 and change, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to see flow going to the north arm, but we only have about a, a foot of space if we bring the berm to 41.92. And so I think that's where that, that plot was if, if we have so we would need 400,000 acre feet 
of inflow to bring the south arm back up, up a foot, which I think we feel pretty good. It would be a pretty horrendous, it would be an epic horrendous month, winter if we only had 400,000 acre feet of inflow. It's the worst we've ever seen, is anybody know, in terms of inflow? 800, 800. Yeah, wasn't it 775 or something? Yeah, that brings about one. It's like yeah, 70, yeah, it's 700. Yeah. Yeah. Was that was that officially the, the worst, or is that just what we, what we know of? Yeah, well recorded. Yeah. So I, I think we have some a fair amount of confidence that we'll have be able to fill it up back up to 4192 and, and then overflow to the north arm again. Um, and then, and that's where you know that that last slide that Christine had is oh well, okay if we had three or four hundred thousand of, of fresh water to come in how might how much might we be able to drop spring that salinity and it looks like we you know we might be able to drop it another five six grams per liter um, so anyway it's I mean the the what ifs are just stacked on each other. Uh, you know, trying to understand all, how all these different variables interrelate with each other. But um, I think circling back to the berm as it stands, I mean, great that you've been able to survey that to get the information. It's being fascinating to see how much it actually has dropped. And, you know, I, I'm, one question I have is well, what is the cross sectional area of flow? You know, and if that was a rectangular weir, or a flat weir, you know, would, would we be at 3190.5 or whatever? Yeah, but that's critical, like the width of, of yeah. that three foot wall. And um, I mean, that would be that would be interesting, and that might be a way we can estimate the flow through that berm. Um, but um, but but I think if if we leave the berm as is. It, and we, and if, if we really have moved, you know, 100,000 acre feet already in the last two months, then I think we're getting closer to that, you know, being able to do a, at least an, another 100,000 over the next six months and more likely two, two to 300. Um, so that I think helps address, you know, I think Joe is your concern. Well, I think everybody's concerned in making sure that we get water into the North Arm as well. But I think that that's also serving the purpose of the protocol of opening up headspace for storage for dilution next spring. We're all saying there was a hundred that's gotten in, give or take, in the summer. Um, there was some some writing in the, in the press for the compass of pumping. That's not that, that that wasn't the same. You know, it's just being evaporated, right? So in two weeks, whatever whatever flows in begins to be stored. Um, you know, and, and brings that elevation up. It's a good point. On the other hand, the safety is retaining some additional volume in that south arm against a dry winter. You won't get as fast a change in salinity, but you'll get more protection from a quick increase. I, it seems like right now the, the safe bet is that we need to wait until we get that bathymetry processed and um, in order to make a decision and, and if it was at all possible to get it done before you know our next September meeting that would be awesome understand it I totally understand if that's not possible but I think that's going to be a really strong um, decision making point for us but I think I don't think that today I mean we have that you know burn modification point on the agenda and I don't know that we there's really I think we probably you know, gone through the, the ringers on like what we could do and what the benefits are. But until we have that, there's, I don't see our division making that modification right now under the circumstances and the unknowns. So I don't know if there's much debate left on that. Unless anybody else has any like really strong opinions about that, um, you know, or, or thoughts to share. Yeah, I guess any, any significant concerns with leaving the firm as it is? And I won't re. I, I would fill up the low spot. That's what I would do, just to give yourself that cushion in case you got a dry winter. I wouldn't say raise it; just fill up your low spot. Well, I think the problem with filling up the low spot, though, is that we're really not moving that much water, you know, to the north arm. I think with the, the rest of the evaporation season, and then what we have left here, we're really not moving that much water. And I think there is a small benefit on what 
salinity we are exporting. And this is probably the time of year where we'd want to move water rather than later when we'll have that fresh water. And I, I would say that we have a pretty safe bet based on you know historic data that we're going to make up that headspace and it'll be with fresher water. So if we can get rid of water that's even just a little bit more dense, we're probably in better shape than if we if we try to slow that flow. Well, the point is that exporting salt. Exactly. If you fill that hole in and the level comes up to 4192, you're going to be continuing to export salt continually. So you just have to look at the difference between this much salt and that much salt. Except for it'll be at a, a time where we're getting the right. fresher water into the system and likely flowing the fresher water over the top. Yeah. But sure, right now it's 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 about as mixed as it's gonna get, right? Like we're not gonna see better mixing, so mm -hmm. so we're probably getting better, you know, higher density. Most water yeah. right now. So I, I'd recommend that we stay where we're at. And, I, and honestly, given the fact that we would have to, you know, procure this and do that, I think that this is probably the way the state's going to go is we leave it where it's at for now until we have that better bathymetry. But I was, I did want to float the idea because we have some time in between the point where we might be able to make this decision that maybe our group, uh, I don't know how many people have not been there. I think there's a lot of us who visited it, but I think it might be neat um, for this group to go out to the berm and talk about maybe engineered um, options that, that could be available. And then for those that haven't been there, just go out and, and see it. And, and that might be something that could be a, uh, of value for some of these, you know, people that haven't been there. So everybody bring your capture. We'll have that. Yeah, seriously. I mean, I think that just you know there would be a, a, a good, good just invite the Army Corps. Yeah. So see. Awesome. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. That'd be awesome. So I think that um, I, I think that like from my perspective, if we can um, organize that, and maybe that's what we do on our next meeting, especially if if we don't think we can have that bathymetry um, process yet, that we go out and we talk about some of these uh, these issues and see where things are at in September. And I think we could, you know, I think I think our division would be happy to host a like lunch or something out there, so we can make it worthwhile. And not everybody needs to come if you don't want to, but I think that would be a good way to spend our next meeting if everybody thinks that's a good idea. The gnats are dead, right? Yeah, I think so. I think I did. Are they dead? Yeah. 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 The next date we had was September 28th. Um, is that yes. it? They signed the end of support Thursday, I think, Brian. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think it's at that point too, if we could, you know, it'd be nice if we could go out and have a similar discussion about, you know, where we're at just while we're there. And maybe, you know, when we think we're going to have that bathymetry, we could set a meeting for this group to, you know, to review and make some some more robust decisions. And we might have to, you know, forego our October meeting date and bump it up a little bit to, to better match that. Because I think it'd be better to do that sooner than later. Um, but for this next one, yeah, we can yeah. do that build trip and then we'll meet as soon as we have that data to review. I think that'd be a good way to good way to do it and shape it up a little bit. Yeah. Well, um the next meeting that or I guess would be our regular meeting is the twenty first. September twenty first. I have that one on the agenda. Georgia says the twenty eighth. Yeah, I, I get that wrong. <laughs> so um, so I guess what you're suggesting then is that we go out. Yeah, if everybody thinks there's, there's some value in that, I think that for me, it's been, I've been out there, you know, since we constructed the berm, I'd like to go out and see what conditions look like and observe that myself. I think that talking about the engineering with engineers on site will have some value. And then again, I don't know how many people haven't actually been there, but I think that it's just a, a pretty neat place to visit. Yeah, there you go. Jeff, who, who does probably talks about this as much as anybody <laughs> hasn't been there. So I think it'd be uh, we need to be out there. So if everybody likes that idea, we're talking about the 21st of so yeah. yeah. And we can also modify that data if we need to. Well, where should we go? Is anybody opposed to the, the filter in place of the meeting? Brian out there. Yeah, I think Brian will be out there for sure. And it's the wrong direction, but we've got the. State's pump station at Hog at this conference room in it. It probably hasn't been occupied in two decades. <laughs> yeah, I have to chase it on the logistics a little bit, though. Oh, yeah. No, it's so going to take like more than the two hour cars. Track and, and we can also, like, we can arrange to have 
bigger vehicles and, and some DNR staff that can, um, you know, hold more than four each. So we can probably help with some logistics, but I think that, you know, we're not going to be able to charter a bus or anything. We'll probably end up with, you know, hopefully we can get different agencies to, to figure out how to get the most people out there. But I can start working on logistics between now and then if everybody's into that. I'd be happy to do a show and tell. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I think we're out there too of all you know, yeah. our instrumentation and how our that'd be really cool site visits generally be out there. Just give me an idea. I'm sure you got good spare tires. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, well, um, I know so we can get the committee members in uh, two minutes and block that day out. Or, uh, yeah. at least. That'd be awesome. And then when you guys have a chance to decide what the time frame is on that processing, maybe we can set our next meeting date based on when we when we have that available. Already on it. So, and then if we're somewhat concluding, I spoke with Tom earlier, and this is actually going to be Tom's last yeah. salinity committee meeting. And Mark will be his um, Mark's all where Tom is uh, Mark is Tom's alternate now. Mm -hmm. It will be now filling this uh, this role on the committee. So I just I wanted to thank Tom for the service um, over the last uh, several years. Um, and we're I think we're, we're really gonna miss uh, having you on here, Tom. You have a lot of yeah. institutional knowledge, and then I, I really am gonna miss hearing you and Thomas um, argue about how much salt <laughs> gets <laughs> removed out of the system. And honestly, I, I, I just want to say I appreciate um, that even though we've had differences of opinions, that we're always able to still remain, you know, pals and, and have these conversations. And it's been really good working with you. I hope that when you come back from your mission, that you uh, come back and, and at least come back to, to visit us and, and work on some grid solid issues with us. So anyway, I, I hope you I'll give Tom a round of applause. Yeah. Well, it's been great working here. You know, in just a few lessons, I'm sure we all know. It's a man-made light. So our decision <laughs> just started back in 59 when they put that Cosworth in. I, and I went to one of those uh, Friends of the Great Salt Lake symposiums and said, what a great advantage that is compared to the Dead Sea, that you have the ability to make the adjustment. Yeah. Right? And, you know, the other lesson I've learned here is you can't control the input to the lake. You cannot. You can't conserve yourself into prosperity. There's just not enough water coming down. You're not going to give it away from the farmers who have the vast majority of it. Only thing you can really do is control evaporation. The state has wisely done that by cutting off the north arm for the, at least the short term. If things get worse, you can do some more. I think you guys know that. So you control evaporation. That's what they did when the lake was high. They added evaporation out in the West Desert. Because you can't control the inflow. You can only control evaporation to the degree. So good group appreciate the technical nature of this bunch that's different than the other boards and committees usually set on so been a pleasure and i'll be gone for a year starting in december and maybe you'll want me back or maybe you appreciate the rest <laughs> and i'll fade away <laughs> thanks guys thank you yeah, thank you Tom. Be a nicer to mark than you are to me <laughs> which will be easy to <laughs> now mark, mark's pretty quiet i think he's gonna he's gonna fit right in there Tom gave me a secret hand about this so nice <laughs> well, i couldn't have written that better if i was going to guess what tom was going to say myself so um, with that again thanks tom and, uh, yeah, really yeah, appreciate everything so i don't know if Probably. we have some last agenda items there yeah. I, uh, I had a we had a plan for the board of maybe yeah, yeah. Terms of um the, so just uh, I'll share my screen real quick. Um, so yesterday at the technical tag meeting, I shared um, a little bit about the Great Salt Lake um, Basin Integrated Plan that the Division of Water Resources is working on, and um, and talked a little bit about the specific studies that that we're starting that we're pulling together. You know. I guess I would mean say some gaps that we have to be able to make decisions and how to manage water. And one of the key, um, and I'm not going to go through that whole slide deck here, um, but what I wanted to do is just introduce that salinity is, a, is in a very important part of this, <laughs> as you all know. And um, um, let me get down to that. Um, you can, um, that. So um, what what we've been trying to do is maybe I'll show this slide 
um, is one of the key questions that we have is how much water does Great Salt Lake need? Um, and we need to gather the information that we need, we need to to be able to answer that. And, and then we subdivide that into three additional questions, kind of a lower tier. How, how much inflow is required to sustain a particular water level? So that's really kind of the hydrology mechanics of how much water in to get to the water level that we observe. Um, but what I highlighted there in red is, um, is, is a key question here is what is the value and consequence of the changing water level? So how much value or impact is there as the lake goes up and down, and um, and then you know what management scheme should be used for safe operating levels for Great Salt Lake. Um, but I think what I wanted to highlight here was just this: what is the value and consequence of changing lake levels? Because I think um, one of the key things here, as we've been thinking about it, there's there's so much science that could be done to understand the system. Um, it's a very complicated system, and I think even more, what makes it even more difficult is it's so dynamic. <laughs> so even as we collect a lot of information, the world just seems to keep changing. And, and so it makes it really hard to forecast things. But when we look at, well, what is the value and impact or value and consequence of changing water levels, kind of see it really boiling down to three key metrics. And Brian actually touched on these as one is dust emissions, two is bird use, and three is salinity. And, um, you know, and, and so as we look at the value of water going into the lake, you know, I think these three metrics are probably going to end up being um, what we end up having to make. Um, my computer is just not cooperating either. Um, well, anyway, I don't know why I won't. <laughs> so for salinity, and I'm sorry, it's hard to read here, um, but but I guess what I want I would like to ask the committee to think about is what kinds of studies can we do to really get toward a long-term salinity management plan? You know, we've been talking about you know, we developed a research plan in 2019. Last fall, before before the salinity really hit crisis mode, we were talking again. Um, probably a year ago, we were talking about well, what are the what research questions should we be looking at as we go forward? And so, as as we're trying to identify for the basic integrated plan, you know, what kinds of studies should be completed um, to be able to make better decisions and. And so what you see here um, is just from, from here to here are the studies that we've talked about. Um, you know, updating the Great Salt Lake Salinity Matrix uh, to incorporate, you know, more information on birds, I think was specifically what we talked about last year. Um, you know, the breach modeling that all, many of you are already involved with, with uh, Utah State University, I think that study is supposed to end next June. Um, but my gut tells me that that's not going to end. We're not going to be done just with our specific um, bridge opening. That's probably going to have to continue. Um, you know, looking at um, enhanced monitoring of flow, I think we, I mean, USGS has been responsive this summer, especially in going out more frequently to do that. Is that, I don't think that was budgeted. Was it? <laughs> so those are those are things. Those are the kinds of gaps that we're trying to identify. Is how can we make sure we're getting the right information we need to make better decisions? Um, some of the other ones are just we talked about today: water and salt through the causeway, um, salt storage in the north arm, and, and mineral extraction and evaporation ponds. How much salt mass do we have, and where is it? Um, you know, we've got estimates of that, but if we're really going to try to be Making better decisions, having better data like that will help us re help refine our mass balance. Um, updating updates to the Great Salt Lake salt mass balance. I know US Christine and USGS have been doing that. Um, salt loads into Great Salt Lake, USGS is doing that. Um, water, you know, water sampling plan, DWQ and wildlife resources and USGS are doing that, and that's going to continue. Um, you know, developing capacity, capability to forecast salt mass changes due to changing water levels. That's something that I know water resources has been working on. 
a long term salinity management plan. Much of this goes, rolls right into that. And then we've talked about a hydrodynamic water quality model of Great Salt Lake. And so I guess what we're trying to do is identify what studies could really help us make better decisions in the long run. I think this, the, the long term salinity management plan will roll up into. I mean, this, a lot of this information is going to go into the salt and water ba balance for the lake itself, but it's also, I think, how we manage the firm is going to roll up into the comprehensive management plan, um, which is also then going to be able to inform well, what kinds of actions do we need to take uh, to make sure that we have enough water for the lake and for all people and all the other uses that we have in the, in the watershed. So I guess the question I have for you is, I guess, you haven't seen this yet. But as I walk through that, are there any learning gaps that we that I didn't cover that we need to make sure we we look into some some more? Jeff, I, I think as you were going through some of those things, I think there's like studies and things that play into some of the subject matters that you've said. But I don't know how much you guys have started to, to identify those things. Are you? Are you looking for people to send you ideas for things that may advance, like a salinity management plan, for example? Um, or are you just simply looking for if there's like larger gaps uh, on this? Well, I think both. I mean, if I'm greedy, both. Um, I think, I think the, at, at the minimum is you know, our, what, what other key gaps might, you know, what are the most important studies you think we need to do to be able to make these? You know, when as we're talking about this firm, you know, I mean, even our discussion today, I mean, knowing, you know, being able to have a firm or a structure that we know where it's at so we can measure or predict what the flows are through that structure would be grand. <laughs> we would, you know, that would have solved a lot of our, eliminated a lot of the discussion we've had over the last three months. You know, having a model, go ahead, go ahead. Finish your thought. Uh, or having having a model that describes, you know, and incorporates all of these calculations that Christine's been doing, that Layla and Craig have been doing, so that we can, you know, turn them out in a model to, you know, to be able to, you know, more quickly evaluate these variables um, would be great. Um, but I guess anything else. I was going to ask you to mention the timeline when we're yeah. asking for these recommendations. We will be prioritizing studies and making a recommendation. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what we're doing now is we're really pulling together, um, you know, what are the gaps? What are the studies that could be done, should be done? And I think in terms of how we're prioritizing, you know, I and mean, what we're doing here, for those of you who haven't heard about the study, is we're really trying to integrate all of these different efforts that are going on by USGS, the strike team, um, you know, the numerous agencies who are working, you know, throughout the watershed, even looking at how we plan our water resources. And, and then what we're trying to do is trying to bring those all into alignment to show how they, they can all, they should all help us make decisions on in three years in terms of you know, the, the legislature gave the division until 2026 to come up with an action plan with recommendations. Um, and, and so what we're trying to do is identify, well, what kinds of studies can we you know, complete in the next few years that can really help make those better decisions? You know, could we make a decision today? I mean, we are making decisions today as to how to better manage our water supply. Um, you know, but what kinds of studies could really move the needle um, so that in three years, we can be not just looking at well, what what are our options now that we can do now that are no regrets options, but what kinds of things can we do that really set a trajectory for the future? And Interesting. So it, it's it's definitely an ambitious plan, and and there's a lot that that could be done. Um, there's probably a lot that should there is a lot that should be done, but what we're wanting to try to do is identify well, what kinds of studies can really help inform that. With the monies that the state has, what Bureau of Reclamation has going into this, um, that can really help um, make those decisions on, on the water supply. November. So we're working on the work plan. We need to finalize the work plan by November. Um, so I think any input you have, the sooner the better. If you have ideas, 
Um, and I think a lot of times that your gut reaction of, you know, eek, you know, why are you doing that or why aren't you doing that is probably where I've been getting the most helpful because I know you are all super busy and don't have time to stare at something like this and think about, you know, what what could we do? Um, but I think those are, I guess, this is what we're trying to do is to just to be able to provide a roadmap going forward over the next three years that can really, um, because I think looking at the, I mean, if you look at the timeline here, if we have to come up with a recommend recommendations in 2026, really 2024 is when we're having to do the bulk of our modeling and just evaluating options and in 2025, we probably have a lot of the science done. We now we're just evaluating different scenarios and you know, what the evaluating trade offs. Um, and then in 2026 is when we're really probably going back and finding those options and, and making decisions on that go into that into the into the plan. So you know, three years sounds like a lot of time, but when we're when we're looking at the scale of this, it's just, it's not. Um, and but I think, you know, there's, I think there's opportunities with, um, in the, the, Car the Army Corps of Engineers is very keen on helping. So there's a different, there's a different regulatory branch and there's the core, <laughs> the core who likes to build projects. And, um, and so they are very interested in what can they do to help with Great Salt Lake. And, and I, and I can tell you, our, our first thought was we have this, Causeway that we're wondering how much water is going through it. And, you know, the Corps likes to build dams and build flow control structures. You know, is that a good fit for them <laughs> in partnership with, you know, we don't want to just send them off and go do that on their own, obviously. But, um, but they're, they're literally knocking on Laura's door. We have money, what can we do? We could build your Cadillac version of yeah, yeah, honestly, that, when they were out here, like they have that ten million dollars, and we we toured around. That was my initial thought too. Was like, okay, yeah. we'd be really well poised to to build that. But they're still coming up a little short on the that Cadillac version. That's so. <laughs> is that from local or Sacramento or DC? Sacramento office. So that's and, that, and that's through. Um, and some Romney bill. I that can't remember which one. That he's talking about is through Romney's bill. Do they have so there's one? other money too. <laughs> <laughs> That's that for the Four hundred thousand dollars planning oh assistance. Yeah. Uh, right. Through you with us to like start to identify some of the projects that they could be working on when we're talking about further diking and other um, strategies. So we'll be talking with them more. And I think, like uh, David said, involving them in their tour would be great. Um, they are super interested in these engineered solutions. Are they back in their office yet? Or are they still on COVID leave? Well, this is the Sacramento folks. That sure, just talking about the local. Not the Utah folks. Local office is still on COVID. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I, I think they never come out of COVID. <laughs> so this, I guess, this is just a one small window into one piece of what we're doing, but specifically salinity, I think is an important part of, as Brian was saying, you know, salinity is really what it got us to a crisis point last fall and, you know, really triggered a whole lot of the discussion we've had in the last nine months and um, really maybe amped it up more than, the, you know, it was increasing that already, but I think, you know, so, I think it's going to come back to, and I think from a from our committee standpoint, the priority really is is you know, we've got to figure out how to manage this burn. Um, that's that's what we've agreed. That's really our only one of our very few levers that we have to manipulate this complicated system. And but um, but as we look forward to the future, um, you know what kinds of studies should we have so we can get to this. You know this um, video game that then can just you know sit and play on them. Sit and say, okay, here's what we need to do. So, um, I mean, I'm kidding, but that's but I'm not. I'd be honest. But that's but anyway. So that's 
so we talked about that and that's where largely these came from is the you know the conversation we did this committee had especially last year in terms of what kinds of studies we need to have but if you have any other ideas that you need that we need to do to feed into this you know please let me know Ben know or Laura know you know you know please let us know so we can figure out if or how we can put that in so anyway that's all I have. Yeah, I don't have anything else. Sorry. Motion to adjourn. Yep. Okay. Thanks again, Tom. Thank you. Second. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.